order. The sitting is resumed. It is time for questions to the Minister of Agriculture and Rural Development. I have to tell members question four has been withdrawn. And we will start uh, with the list of questions. And I call Mr. Sean Rogers. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. Deputy Speaker. Question number one, Minister. Minister. Members will know that my department takes bovine um, TB very seriously. We have a robust EU Commission approved TB eradication programme in place um, that is based on testing to detect infected cattle, removing infected animals and reducing the risk of disease spread through movement controls and other biosecurity measures. The same disease control measures are applied to both beef and dairy herds. Every TB breakdown is subject to an epidemiological assessment by a DARD veterinary officer and specific public and animal health advice is provided. In addition, disease control measures are instigated to prevent the, the spread of bovine TB to and from other herds. Post-mortem and laboratory test results including strain type information are provided to the farmer during the course of a confirmed TB outbreak and biosecurity advice and advisory leaflets. Widely published research over the years means that the main risk factors for, for a herd Having a TB breakdown are well known. Advice on how farmers can best protect their herd is publicised on the DARD website. However, TB is a complex and multifactorial disease, which means that it's often not possible to determine a single cause of infection for every TB breakdown with a reasonable degree of certainty. I have made it repeatedly clear that my objective is to progressively reduce the level of TB here with the ultimate aim of eradication from our cattle herds. That is why I have commissioned a TB strategic partnership group to prepare an eradication strategy and an implementation action plan. The group has already commenced its work and has recently obtained initial consultation input from industry representative organisations and interested individuals. And I look forward to the group's interim report, which will be presented in June 2015. Call Mr. Rogers for supplementary. Thank you, thank you, Minister. Minister, can you outline um, how the test and vaccinate or remove pilot that is taking place in, on the Badgers has taken place in parts of County Down is progressing, and what results have been gleaned so far from the study? And when do you hope that instance of uh, that, that there will be a radical reduction in the, in the level of TB, of TB like, the, like Scotland? Yes, the first year of the TBR Wildlife Intervention Research Project has been um, successfully completed in. Um, the Ban Bridge area of County Down. Field work is due to commence again in June 2015. Some 280 individual badgers were captured, sampled, microchipped, vaccinated and released, and there were a further 350 recaptures. Those recaptured badgers were released following identification checks. As the member is aware, TVR is a research project rather than a strategy or a pilot. Findings from, from this um, research project should be able to provide us with an indication of how effective the TVR approach is and then inform us in terms of a longer term strategy. One of the aims of the project is to assess the feasibility of the set side of um, TB test on captured badgers and there's only one commercially available test at, at present. So over the next few months the testing of the samples from all the captured badgers will be completed along with the evaluation of the field data. And we need to be reasonably sure that there's nothing significant to prevent the use of the test in year, in the test in year two of TVR and beyond. So there's quite a significant body of work. And alongside of that, then, we have the work of the TB Strategic Partnership Group in terms of looking at every aspect in relation to TB eradication, how we can get to a stage where we drive out the disease. Uh, and we're all obviously very keen for that to be the case. I think that that's a significant body of work. And I look forward to getting their interim report, as I said, in June 2015. Call Ms. Rosalie McCarley. Um, can I um, thank the Minister for her answers and can I ask the Minister um, if she can tell us if she content that the TB uh, strategic uh, group is, is on track to achieve its aims? Yes, um, the, the new group has been tasked to act in the public interest to develop a long term strategy for the eradication of TB in cattle here. And the, as I said in the initial answer, they're very much engaged at this stage in um, fact-finding, and it's received presentations from DART officials, from AFBI, for, uh, on TB-related issues, and it has recently completed a consultation exercise. And the group are currently considering all those responses and meeting with the responders where they feel it's appropriate. As I said, they, they intend to produce the report to me in June 2015, and then a final strategy with an accompanying action plan to be in place by the end of this year. Um, I think 
you know, we need to look at lessons that have been learned, and particularly lessons that have been learned from um, New Zealand and Australia, are that eradication strategy works best whenever the industry are in the, are in the lead, and, and where government and industry share responsibilities and costs. So our relationship with the stakeholders is um, obviously enhanced whenever there's genuine partnership within the, the industry and government. So I think that um, the work that we're involved with, the work the, the strategy group is involved with, is um, absolutely vital in terms of, of getting to the position where we actually drive out this disease. Call Mr. Robin Swan. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. The Minister said one of the key factors is removing infected animals from herds. Can I ask her what she's actually doing to improve the times that the department's taking to remove reactors actually off farm? Well, if the member wants to write to me in relation to any particular instances, it's not, a, it's not an issue that has been highlighted with me as a, as a major concern in the industry. But if the member wants to talk to me outside of question time, I'm very happy to have a discussion if, if there are any delays in terms of what the department's doing on, on lifting reactors. Call Mr. Declan McAleer for a question. Cash uh, a question to I remain firmly committed to tackling issues of rural poverty and isolation, and I am delighted to have extended the Tackling Poverty and Social Isolation Programme into 15-16 budget year, with an associated extension to the programme for government target of £4 million. Already plans are well developed to continue to assist rural transport, access and associated health issues, to maximise access to benefits and services, to support rural community development, to support youth employment and entrepreneurship, to assist in tackling fuel poverty, to assist in relation to broadband issues. In addition, officials are currently looking at options for support to help community and voluntary groups provide much-needed resources for their local communities. Much focus is very much on tackling on ensuring that all tackling rural poverty and social isolation funding is targeted at making life better for those rural dwellers living in isolated and deprived areas and indeed on building on the great achievements to date during um, the last number of years. Mr. McAleer for supplementary. Uh, I thank the Minister for her answer. I wonder could the Minister provide any details of any new initiatives which the Trusty Program may offer in the 2015-2016 period? Gurumagad. Yes, absolutely. The, the, the work to date and the premise, I suppose, around the whole tackling poverty work has been around three key areas, and that's been around ac um, access, access, poverty, financial poverty, and social isolation. And the, all the initiatives that we have been able to take forward have been very effective in terms of meeting the aims and, and targeting those three, car three key areas. And I know the members are very aware of you know, the assisted rural travel scheme, which we intend to do more of in the next year. The rural support charity that provides a listening ear for farmers and rural families. Again, I want to continue to support the work that they do on the ground. The rural community development work, um, again, the networks on the ground do fantastic work in terms of trying to empower, to um, lift the skill range in rural communities and rural community groups in terms of access and funding. Um, the Rural Youth Entrepreneurship Programme, actually helping unemployed rural young people um, to help them get, develop their skills and, and get into um, new areas of work. But alongside all of that work and, and other things that I haven't mentioned, there are some of the new initiatives that we're certainly looking towards are um, particularly around the availability of transportation vehicles for rural community and voluntary groups. And I've asked officials to um, bring together something like that, and that's certainly something that I'm very keen to roll out next year. I know it's something that, when I'm out and about talking to community groups, is something that's certainly um, often requested. The other areas that we're scoping are around the need um, to make a small capital grant scheme available to community and voluntary groups to allow them to purchase um, maybe smaller capital items that, that they may um, require. So we're, we're working all that up, and I intend to roll a scheme out of that nature um, in the 15-16 year also. I'm also very keen that we work with other departments, and um, I have asked officials to, to liaise with other departments around how we can work collectively, particularly around building on the good work which we um, have completed in the past with DECAL around health in the mine project, particularly around fuel poverty issues. And I think that um, we've got a great opportunity with the money that I've prioritised for these initiatives to be able to make a real difference in rural communities. Call Mr. Kieran McCarthy. Last come call you. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, how does the Minister um, think the proposed cuts um, in the rural transport will affect or indeed will improve social inclusion? And is the Minister in dialogue with TransLink to overcome these problems? 
I'm not in direct dialogue, but I can assure you that in terms of the work that I'm involved with in working in conjunction with DRD um, and in terms of rural transport, I'm continuing to fund that in the next financial year, and I've made that clear. My officials are talking with the DRD officials on um, what their budget input is going to be, but certainly I'm giving assurance that I'm committed to making sure that I take forward the assisted rural um, travel scheme, so that's that joint initiative which we have with DRD. The other thing I would say, and I think it's very important in the future, I'm about to bring legislation to the floor of the House in relation to rural proofing. And I think that all departments need to be mindful of rural communities when they're taking decisions on budgets. And I think that that piece of legislation, which I hope to have good conversation with um, all members of the House over the next um, wee while, I think is going to be necessary, particularly given the financial climate that we're in, if we're going to be serious about making sure there's a quality for rural people and rural dwellers when it comes to um, making budget decisions and, and policy decisions for departments. Call Mr. Alden McGuinness. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for her detailed responses, uh, particularly in relation to uh, social iso isolation. But uh, the, could, could she quantify the uh, rural development programme monies that will be specifically targeted at uh, rural isolation and, and indeed uh, combating rural poverty? Yes, um, under the current programme for government, we'd set out in this current CSR period, we set out 16 million, and I've set aside 4 million for the, the um, further year that we're going to have in the CSR project. And that money, maybe on the scale of things, doesn't sound like a significant pot of money, but it's very much acted as leverage funding, and we've been able to work in partnership with other um, government departments. And, and I think the, the figure maybe that we've leveraged in is maybe an additional 11 million on top of that again. So, quite significant investment across quite a range of issues, everything from fuel poverty to employability for young people to the, the small capital grant scheme to all the sort of work that we're involved with is all very valuable work. Call Mr. Thomas Buchanan. And thank you, Minister, for your response. One of the difficulties within the, some of the isolated rural areas is still access to broadband. How do you see that this will address that issue in those areas where there's still a black spot as far as broadband is concerned? Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree with the member. Broadband is that um, big bugbear of people in rural communities who find themselves with no access to broadband. Um, it is obviously the responsibility of the Department of, of Data Department to take forward broadband. However, I feel that my department has a role to play in terms of trying to plug the gaps for those people in rural areas that don't have a connection or maybe have a connection, but the speed's not, not worth having. So, um, I have set aside funding um, during the last during the current CSR, and I have set aside funding again under the new rural development programme, a small pot of money that will be able to maybe look at um, bespoke arrangements for maybe small villages, small pockets of areas, because the member will know well that when it comes to the big providers, they don't go into rural areas, but there's maybe, I mean, maybe 10 houses you know, within a, a, quite a spread out area. So I think that um, I feel it's my responsibility to try to work with that aid in terms of trying to address the gaps that are there. And we, as I said, we've set out funding under the Rural Development Programme. We've also set aside funding where we're actually working with that aid. We've looked at all the areas, all the postcodes that don't have a connection, and then I've used deprivation stats to be able to um, prioritise the areas that we, we touch on first. But certainly I can give assurance that I'm going to do all that I can to target and to plug the gaps that are there in relation to broadband. Well, Mr Jim Allister for a question. Question three. While the price paid to producers and pricing structures is in the peg processing sector are a commercial matter, Outside of my department's remit, I believe that all elements of the supply chain, the producer and the processor alike, should work together to ensure that the pig sector in the north remains profitable and sustainable. I am not aware of any evidence of price fixing in the pig processing sector, but if my department were to discover that um, or to be presented with any evidence of such activity, the matter would be immediately referred to the Competition and Markets Authority for investigation. Any allegations, uh, particularly in relation to any, any um, allegations of anti-competitive activity. My department will continue to do all that it can to improve efficiency and competitiveness, to build resilience in the pig sector and to help to develop new opportunities and grow markets across the EU and beyond, especially in the Far East. I recently met with local pork processors to discuss access to new trade markets, including China and Australia, and my officials are working to secure access to those markets, which would hopefully mean greater returns for the pig sector. My department is um, hoping to host the inspections necessary to secure approval to export to these countries in the first half of this year. Call Mr. Alistair for supplementary. The Minister will be aware of the great concern amongst pig producers as to the huge disparity that arises.
between the price paid in Northern Ireland and the price paid in GB. Now, a differential of 4 or 5p per kilo might be understandable given the transport costs, but when it reaches something of the order of 18p, there has to be another explanation. Uh, the processors themselves have been far from transparent about it. What does the minister think the explanation is if it isn't suppression for mutual benefit amongst processors of the price? I, mean, I absolutely agree. I agree with the industry in terms of the differential. I don't think the differential is acceptable. And I don't think it's explainable in relation to um, the difference because of the transport cost, because certainly if you weigh it up, and I know recently the ARD committee had I think, a presentation, and this was very much explored, and I think the transport costs that are being used are not um, I don't really believe that they're reflective of the actual costs although that would cause the, the differential. For me, it's about, um, I suppose, trying to explore the new markets, which creates obviously more demand, which should in turn create um, an increase in price. And that's very much um, where I feel that my role is in terms of um, being able to help and assist the industry to be able to grow. We're very much looking forward to a visit from the Chinese inspectors before the end of March. We're very much um, looking forward to a visit from the Australian authorities before the end of June. These are all, I suppose, um, areas where I can actually make a difference and where I can be effective in terms of um, helping the industry. Suffice to say, and this goes for the pig sector or any other sector out there, farmers deserve to have a fair price for what they produce. We've always said that. We've made it very clear to um, whenever myself and the Daddy Minister met with the new Going for Growth um, group, whenever they came into place, that unless there's fairness across the supply chain, we can have all the wonderful plans we want, but they'll not be effective if we don't help sustain the, the, the farmers in terms of going forward. So in terms of um, what we can do, what my department can do, it's about exploring new markets, it's about working with the sector, it's about helping them around efficiency, it's about providing grant aid to help them with all those aspects. It's also about if there's any evidence to identify that there's any sort of fixing or price fixing, then that's where we need to get involved and we need to report that, as I said, to the Competition and Marketing Authority. Well, Mr. Joe Byrne. Mr. Deputy Speaker, I thank the Minister for her answers. Given that the Minister has talked about trying to extend to markets beyond the EU, when can the Minister hope to get a, an export licence via London to make sure that pork and indeed other products can be exported from Northern Ireland? And will she be raising this issue with Commissioner Phil Hogan when he does visit Northern Ireland at the end of March and he's due to meet the, the Art Committee that day for a meeting and lunch? And we hope to be pressing him on a number of issues as well. Very happy to raise the issue with Commissioner Hogan when he comes on the 24th. I'll also be meeting him before the ARD Committee and we'll have a number of engagements throughout the, the course of um, his visit here that day. But yes, I mean, in terms of securing our licences, that's our remit in terms of the export certificates, making sure that we have everything in place. It's about working with the industry to make sure that they will meet the targets or the inspections that, that from our um, visiting um, officials from, from the different markets that we're targeting. As I said, Australia and China are particularly big markets for the pig sector at this moment in time. And um, I'll certainly be doing all that I can, including potentially a, a visit to China um, for some political discussions on how we can actually make sure that we secure access into that market. Call Mrs. Joanne Dobson. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Fairness in pricing is absolutely essential to the agricultural industry. Yet the minister has done little but express platitudes in her four years in office. So can I ask, in the event of price fixing, even if it is commercial, what powers or actions, in addition to expressing concern, can the minister actually take? Well, I think I've referred to it now twice, but the Competition and Markets Authority is the venue, is the, is the place where we will go. If the member has any evidence to suggest there's price fixing going on, my door is always open. Come and bring it to me and I'll take it to the appropriate um, place where I need to take it. We need to make sure that the industry is supported. I can stand over way more than platitudes. I can stand over actually what I do to help this, the sector. I can stand over the work that the department's doing in terms of our CAFRI advisors around looking at efficiency, around sustainability, around cash flow, around all those areas of work. But outside of that, if we're going to try and guard the industry against the fluctuations in prices, one of the areas that we're going to have to be very serious about being involved with is around the whole area of export growth, around the markets that we're targeting. And as I said, I've referred to the work that we're doing in relation to China, Australia, and other markets that the industry identify are their target markets. So it's, there's quite a lot of work going on. But I again reiterate, if there is any evidence to suggest that there's any price fixing going on, please bring it to me, because at this moment in time, I have nothing on my desk to suggest that's the case. 
Call Mr. Oliver McMillan. I thank the Minister for her answers. Uh, the Minister, with all these new trade opportunities uh, uh, for the pork industry that you have mentioned, would you agree with me that this is the best way for to install not, uh, not only prices back into the market but also install confidence within the, the, the pork industry? Yes, absolutely. The recent meeting that, which I um, held with the pig industry back in January, they advised that being able to export into Australia and China would enable this is from the processor side of things, where they're saying they will enable them to be able to pay more for their pigs due to returns for these markets. So therefore, in my opinion, securing approval to export um, may mitigate the impact of other market forces. However, obviously it would still be a, a, a commercial issue between the processor and the producer. But it comes back to fairness in the supply chain. It comes back to making sure we have markets that we're able to sell into. And I'm hopeful that we're going to be able to open up these new markets in the time ahead that will really be a lifeline to the, to the pig industry and to the other markets that we're targeting for beef, dairy and all the other sectors that are there. Call Mr Pat Sheehan for a question. Yes, Deborah Craig, question five, please. The second annual progress report on the Rural White Paper Action Plan was published on the DARD website in December 2014. It provides details of progress by departments in implementing their com uh, commitments in the action plan during the period from the launch of the initiative in June 2012 up until the 30th of June 2014. The report indicates that departments continue to make good progress in implementing their commitments, with most on track to be achieved when the time frame specified. I see the Rural White Paper Action Plan as a, very much as a live initiative which continues to respond to the needs of rural dwellers and I have therefore asked my executive colleagues to identify new and challenging actions to be included in a refreshed action plan which I hope to finalise during 2015. With budgets now set for 2015-16, my officials are engaging with members of the Interdepartmental Committee on Rural Policy to encourage departments in identifying new actions which will make meaningful contribution to the quality of life for our rural communities. I'm pleased with the progress by departments in implementing the commitments in the current action plan and I will continue to work with my executive colleagues to ensure that this important rural initiative continues to deliver real and positive benefits for those that are living in our rural areas. Call Mr Sheehan for supplementary. I've got a free last concordos going back a selection area, I sucked a fragra. Can the Minister detail the policy uh, objectives of the new rural proofing uh, bill? Go Yes, the, the proposed bill will support the equitable treatment of rural dwellers by requiring their needs and the impact on rural communities to be appropriately addressed in the development and delivery of policy and public services. The executive signed up to rural proofing back in 2002 and I want to strengthen that commitment by making sure that the rural issues are an integral part of development of government policy and public services and consideration of the needs of rural dwellers that is firmly embedded across government. The bill proposes to introduce a duty on all government departments and local councils to consider the needs of people living in rural areas when they are developing strategies, policies and plans. This will place the executive's existing commitment to undertake rural proofing on a statutory footing. The policy objectives of the proposed bill are to require the effective implementation of rural proofing across government, to establish Dard's role in promoting and encouraging rural proofing across, across government and providing advice and guidance where necessary to require information and data on rural proofing to be made available in a transparent way in a report that will be laid before the Assembly, and then to put in place effective arrangements for cooperation between public authorities and sharing best practice. Well, Mr. Patsy McGlone for supplementary. Thanks very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her response up until now. Uh, could I ask the Minister, uh, referred briefly to it there, of putting rural proofing on a statutory footing. Could I ask the Minister what, what she has in mind by that and uh, in what way would she mainstream that or suggest to mainstream that across all other government departments where, uh, which have a meaningful and significant impact upon rural dwellers? Yes, well, the, the bill isn't, isn't, um, s sets out very clearly what, what it is that we're trying to achieve. The objectives, as I've just referred to, are really about putting um, on a statutory footing the fact that rural proofing needs to happen when it comes to policy development plans, strategies, whether that be in government departments or indeed in councils also. I think it's very important that that, that, that happens also. And I think that whilst there is a commitment across government departments to rural proof, and many um, my departments involved in actually training policy people across 
all departments. I think that it's important that there is, in fact, a statutory um, obligation in all departments. I think it's important that there is, in fact, a, a, a mechanism that all departments have to lay before this assembly for scrutiny, for discussion, what actually they have done in terms of making sure that they have protected the rights of rural dwellers. So I think we've got a real opportunity here to really put in, in place really effective arrangements that will make a real difference to the lives of rural dwellers. And it really will be, I think, an, an opportunity also to enhance the effectiveness of cooperation across government departments and, again, um, across councils. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree for supplementary. Deputy Speaker, does the Minister not accept that the current annual reporting system is really a waste of time? Instead of simply asking each department what it's done during the year, would it not be better to give each of them a set of targets to perform against or a set of key performance indicators that they can be measured against? I think that this bill is going to be an opportunity for us to improve what's there, to build on what's there. What's there is, was a starting point. It was, I suppose, an attempt by the executive at that time to be able to really um, to bring rural proofing onto the stage and onto the platform for departments. But what I'm trying to do now is make sure that it is more effective. And the fact that, as part of the legislation which we've set out, the draft legislation, it will include an obligation for departments to have to lay reports, which are then open for scrutiny, and um, all members of this House will have an opportunity to, to, to be able to take a look at that. So for me, uh, this is a necessary piece of work, and I look forward to it being debated. And we're out at this moment in time in, cons in consultation with um, rural, rural communities, rural dwellers, and I encourage everybody to, to take part, so particularly all elected members, to take part in that and voice your, your support for the, the bill going forward. And I look forward, as I said, to the discussion that we're going to have in the House. Call Ms. Michelle McElveen for a question. Question six. To date, there has been 1.255 million South East EFF funding allocated to projects in the Kilkeel area. There has been 0.102 million to our glass based projects and 0.186 million to Port of Ogie. In addition, a further 0.533 million has been awarded to projects that span all three target areas with benefits being shared across the whole three villages. Ms. McElveen for supplementary. Th thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Given the reported situation in Port of Ogie, where the Council has accepted a letter of offer from the Sea Flag for a 3G pitch after a lengthy and robust um, six month process, including obtaining planning permission and thorough consultation, only then to be told that the offer has been withdrawn, while DART officials then inform the local press that it might be withdrawn, but instead subject to an economic appraisal. Can the Minister please provide some explanation why so many conflicting messages are being sent out and to assure the people of Port of Ogie that they will not be shortchanged in the distribution of these monies at the expense of perhaps more politically favourable projects in South Down? Well, the member will be very aware how the decisions are made and how, um, in this case, and I'll try to make it very clear for you, it's not about favouring any, any project, it's about making sure that we have um, made sure that we've made sure that we've went through all of the, the concerns, the objections, all the issues that have been raised. But I'm, I'll try to make it um, very succinct for you and clear for you. Sea Flag has received an application from Mars Leisure Centre seeking EFF funding of 302,171 for a synthetic football pitch in Port of Ogie. This application was presented to my department for approval following a recommendation by Seaflag. However, in assessing the project, a number of concerns have been raised in relation to how the project meets the objectives of the funding programme, the timescales to complete the project, and then the benefits for the community. So there are three key issues which we need to overcome. And if we're able to do that and we're able to overcome them, then I don't have a problem or don't foresee a problem in terms of the department allowing that recommendation to, to go further. So the department has recommended that before any offer of grant that um, will be made, a full independent economic appraisal is required to critically examine the need for the project, the full range of options available to address that need, and the preferred options which offer the best value for money. So if the project has um, a benefit for the local community, if it stands up to um, scrutiny in terms of the economic appraisal, then I don't foresee a problem. But in terms of um, clarity, hopefully that sets out just exactly what it is that um, what the issue is and what we're trying to work our way through. The member would also be very aware that I'm keen to make sure we spend every penny of this in these communities. So I'm very keen to do that. So there's absolutely no barrier from Dard's point of view in terms of trying to get this project spent on the ground. Call Mrs. Karen McKevin. Speaker, can I ask the Minister, um, with the distribution of the European Fisheries Fund monies, could the Minister give us an idea on what job creation onshore has been created in Kilkeel and Glass with this much welcome uh, investment? 
has been much welcome investment. I don't have the, the stats with me in relation to um, the job creation, but the member has been is very aware of some of the really worthwhile projects that, that have um, been brought forward under the, the EFF funding. And obviously that pot of money is closed now, but we look forward to the new pot of funding and all the opportunities that there will be there for the industry and for the local um, community that surround, surrounds the, the fishing villages. But I'm very happy to actually provide um, the member in writing just in terms of the job creation figures. Order. Uh, that ends the period for listed questions. We will now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Mike Nesbitt. Deputy Speaker, thank you. Perhaps the Minister could uh, just refresh the House's memory in terms of the projected costs uh, of moving the Dart headquarters to Ballykelly. Um, the figures are in relation to, I think it's around 30 million for the resource and about 12 million for um, capital. I don't actually have the figures exactly with me, but we're talking somewhere around that. But needless to say, it's all been well costed. It's been well um, set out in terms of the business case. It's going to be a fantastic project for the North West. Um, I recently, in the last number of weeks, I was up, met with a number of community groups, met with the elected representatives, who are very keen to see the project on the ground. This is a big um, opportunity for the executive to show its commitment to rural areas, for the executive to show its commitment to decentralising public sector jobs. The member will also be aware that I have set out um, not just the move to Ballykelly, but also the move for fisheries into South Down, for forestry into Fermanagh, for Rivers Agency into Lockery. This is, um, for me, very clearly a, a win for those rural communities. It's a win for those people that work in public service and who want to find an opportunity um, outside of the Greater Belfast area. So the economic benefits, I believe, set, set, um, are set out very clearly and stand up for themselves in terms of the move. And we're on target to deliver, as I have set out clearly in the past. Well, Mr. Nesbitt, for a supplementary. Thank you very much. I thank the Minister for, uh, for that answer. Um, she, she will be aware that in terms of decentralisation, uh, Coleraine has vacant government buildings. So why has she not considered them as a viable alternative? The issue in terms of um, Coleraine has, has um, arisen after the fact. It's arisen after decisions have been taken in relation to the move. And I've said it many times in this House, and I can provide it for the member in writing if he needs that reassurance again. We very clearly set out all the available areas that we could look at. The North West was identified based on objective criteria. It was identified based on the fact that there was, it's prudent in that there's executive um, owned land there which we could utilise. So for me, again, I would clearly set out the benefits of moving to the North West. It's going to be a fantastic opportunity for investment in the North West. It's a fantastic opportunity for decentralising public sector jobs and for giving rural people an opportunity to avail of public sector jobs without having to travel to the Greater Belfast area. Well, Mr Ian McCree for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister content with the information that our department has given farmers for the new single farming payments that's been implemented this year? Well, it is certainly a time of big change for, for all farmers, given that we're going through um, the cap reforms. Yes, I think that we're, we're working very hard to be able to provide all that information um, through a number of avenues, through our DAR direct offices, through our um, website. There's a lot of information which we put out there. So right through the process, the more information that we receive, we put it out there for farmers. There's a lot of queries coming in, which we expect, as particularly as we move into the 2015 single application form process for May. Um, I'm encouraging a lot of people to go, more farmers to go online. Obviously, there's significant advantages for both the farmer and the department in terms of um, more people doing that. But yes, we're endeavouring to try and put as much information out there as possible. But if the member um, has picked up on somewhere maybe where we can improve or we can get more information out there, then we're very happy to, to utilise that. Well, Mr. McCray for supplementary. Thank you. There's a large number of uh, farmers who are losing their conacre land due to the landowners now starting to farm their land. Will the minister issue clear guidance to give clarity over what conditions need to be met in order for a single farm payment to be claimed? The, the one area actually which I forgot to say is also that um, both uh, the department are, are going out and doing roadshows again about trying to get that information out there. But yes, you're right. I mean, I've um, taken part in a number of um, roadshows, which have been clearly the numbers that are coming along to the roadshows shows that there's a demand for the information. And one of the issues that continually comes up is the fact that there may be a lack of um, land available in Conacher because people feel, landowners feel, that they're going to be able to um, make more money out of holding on to their land. 
And we are encouraging, and I'm encouraging landowners to really think carefully about that, because I don't think it's going to be as lucrative as people feel it's going to be, particularly as we move towards a flat rate over the years. There's an online calculator um, on the DARD website, which I encourage people to use, because that will clearly show you what it would mean for you as an individual in terms of um, the support that you um, think. The other, I suppose, warning I would put out to landowners that um, are going to try and cheat the system. This is about active farmers. We need the money to go to active farmers. This is what the reform is about. That's something that I'm very much wedded to. There will be checks carried out to make sure that you are indeed an active farmer. I think we are in a bit of a difficult situation in that we all would have liked to see Europe going further in terms of the definition of an active farmer. However, that, that hasn't been the case. So we have to work within what we have, but certainly we're endeavouring to get as much information out there as possible to all farmers. Call Mr David Michael Veen for a topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And just following on from my friend Mr. McRae's question, would the minister, um, or does the minister believe that the s system for administrating single farm payments is much better today than it has been in previous years? Yes, I do. Um, I think you can clearly see that from the improvements that we've made year on year in terms of our targets on paying single farm payments. This year we've um, again exceeded the our 2014 we exceeded the target and I want to keep continuing to build on that. We have done over the last number of years and certainly that's um, something that I'm very committed to, it, it, particularly given all the issues that face the farming sector. Cash flow is a major issue so getting their single farm payment in time um, is key. So yes, I, I am content that we have made vast improvements and will continue to do that. Mr. McElveen for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and I do thank the Minister for her answer. In the knowledge then that the system that we have at the minute has been an evolving system, and as you quite rightly say, um, where improvements have had to be made, where decisions have been taken erroneously by the Department, or really where the Department has made mistakes in calculations in what was clearly an imperfect system, does the Minister believe that it is right and proper that not those farmers who, to use your words, to try to cheat the system, but who were genuine and, and made no mistakes, but the mistake was made on the part of the department. Does the minister believe that it is in any way acceptable that those outstanding amounts are continue to be pursued by the department? Um, the member will be aware that we have an appeals process in place, and that is actually to protect the farmer, um, and something that I think is, is um, a vital service that goes alongside the department administering single farm payments. But yes, you're right, and, and I understand the frustration that anybody would feel, particularly if it's a department um, error and a department fault. But I encourage anybody who feels that they don't have a fair um, outcome in relation to an inspection or in relation to how they've been treated by the department to actually avail of that appeals process. Mr. Alex Atwood for a topical question. Uh, thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Uh, the minister will be aware of uh, her colleague, Minister Simon Coveney's recent visit to America, uh, which in substantial part was about promoting the sale of Irish beef now that that's available. Can the Minister update the House in respect of where we are and where Britain is in relation to accessing that market for the same product? Yes, and it's an ongoing um, discussion which I have with Simon Coveney, and we are meeting again on Wednesday at the North South Ministerial Council, so that will be um, it's a standing item in terms of discussion. We have a very effective um, group in place, which is Dard and Daffam in the 26 counties, who come together to work particularly in relation to trade. Obviously, um, the fact that new markets have opened up for the 26 counties, we're obviously wanting to get in on, on some of that also. So um, that work's ongoing to allow us to be able to follow suit and also have access to those markets. Mr Atwood for supplementary. I thank the Minister for answer so far. But to be more specific, where are we specifically in relation to export licences for relevant products into America? It's one thing to work with Simon Coveney, which is very welcome. But if we're not able to access the same markets for some of the same products, it's very hard to work with somebody in those circumstances. Well, it all comes down to export certificates, and um, the member knows well that um, in terms of the negotiations which we have with third countries, with um, no matter what, what other market that we're targeting, we have to work with um, DEFRA in England. Um, we have a strong relationship with DEFRA in terms of trying to get into those markets. We're particularly working um, with them in the minute in relation to the Chinese market and trying to open that, open that out, and we'll have inspectors, as I said, here before the end of March, and I know they're visiting some factories in England. So I'm very much taking a two-pronged approach, and I'm very much working with DAFR in terms of trying to get access into markets, but I'm also working with um, uh, DAFM in the South to make sure that where there are opportunities for the local industry to be able to um, export and be part of the export certificates that they are able to achieve, then 
that is something that I think that is so beneficial for, for the local industry. Call Ms. Joanne Dobson for topical question. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Is the Minister satisfied with the outcomes of the findings of the Section 25 analysis of the Northern Ireland Rural Development Programme for 2007 to 2013, and in particular its findings with regards to the ratio of Protestant and Catholic beneficiaries? Well, I don't know if the member is trying to point to the fact that there's discrimination in the Rural Development Programme in relation to Protestant Catholic beneficiaries, but that's certainly not the case. All projects are considered on merit. Your own party colleagues sit on groups that distribute the funding. So if there's any questions in relation to how, you think, how decisions are taken, then I think that I'd be very happy to hear from you in relation to any issues that you have in relation to discrimination. For me, the rural community, it's not about targeting Catholics or Protestants. It's not about nationalism and unionism. It's about rural communities. It's about supporting those people in rural communities. No matter what element or what projects come forward, there's an onus on the Rural Development Programme to support all people in those rural communities. Ms. Dobson for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her answer, but will she accept that there was much room for improvement in the last programme, and how will she ensure that the new Rural Development Programme will have increased access to the PUL community? We are looking at we have a very strong stakeholder group in place, and we did for the current programme, and we will now put our new stakeholder group in place, who very much oversee, analyse um, the Rural Development Programme and I'm quite sure that if there have been any concerns in relation to any community not having access to funding but the member will be aware that we had in place um, a, a, a targeted area of work which actually helped the PUL community um, build capacity around um, achieving funding. You'll also be very aware that we have um, did a lot of work in relation to um, faith-based um, groups and encouraging them again to look towards funding right across not just the Rural Development Programme but EU funding and, and all other avenues. So there's quite a significant body of work that's ongoing and I'm quite sure we'll continue into the new programme. Call Mr Robin Swan for a topical question. Thank you very much Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. I'm sure the Minister is well aware of the paramyxial virus problem within our home and pigeon fraternity. Is she aware of any restrictions currently in place at the minute on individual breeders actually importing vaccines? There has been no change in legislation in relation to um, breeders importing vaccines. The legislation that has been there has been there I think, since 2005, so there has no, there's been no change recently. Um, the vaccine is bought in from England through either vet service, through um, I think there's three, three areas where, where actually it can be bought in veterinary service through wholesale pharmaceutical suppliers. Um, uh, there's another area which I can't recall, but I, I can get the, the member the details. But if he's any concerns, I'd be happy for him to talk to officials just in relation to um, maybe potential issue that he has picked up. Mr. Swan, for supplementary. I thank the minister for clarifying that there may be a third issue, and I think it was regarding to possibly home and pigeon societies and actually clubs, and maybe the facility being opened out to them to import the vaccine themselves. Yeah, yeah, just I've just found a note. Um, the pharmacist can or can import it, the vet the vet can import it and the wholesale dealer or agriculture merchant can import it. Now you don't have to, the pigeon doesn't have to be examined, medically examined by any of those people. However, there are some protocols in place, so maybe that's what the member's referring to, but I'll get officials to um, contact you just to, to have further discussion. Well, Mr Chris Little for a topical question. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Can I ask the Minister for an update in relation to the review of the implementation of animal cruelty legislation? Yes, I um, have an interim report now on my desk and I will be discussing it with officials over the incoming days and then I hope to be able to report it to, to members. Mr Little, for a supplement. I thank the Minister for her response and look forward to uh, hearing the interim findings in relation to that important report. Um, in addition to uh, the wider review, would the Minister also join me in condemning uh, the concerning accounts we have received of brutal cat poisoning in the Dundonald area of East Belfast and take this opportunity to advise members of the public how best to respond and seek action against this type of crime? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I concur with you in relation to condemning all acts of animal cruelty and it has been a I suppose a hot topic in the media over the last number of days in relation to the case that um, the horrific case that we we've, we've witnessed and has um, thankfully been went through the courts and, and been dealt with and I and I welcome the outcome of that and I and I actually commend the, the DARD staff for the work that they have done in relation to seeking that prosecution and 
and taken that, that case to court. But yes, absolutely, people should look towards the DARD um, website in terms of how to report animal cruelty, and um, should look towards our DARD, um, DARD direct offices in terms of um, getting support. If they have any issues at all, please come forward and let our vets get involved and let our vets um, investigate properly.